I'm John Forbes, AutoCAD Product Manager here at Autodesk. Since the earliest days of civilization, a few highly talented, motivated men and women have led the way in discovering new technologies that have dramatically changed the way people live their lives. The discovery of fire, the printing press, the light bulb, the transistor, all these are examples of new technologies that have dramatically changed society forever. Some people feel that a highly talented team of research scientists here at Autodesk are on the verge of making just such an important discovery, a discovery that will change the way people live, work, and play, a discovery that will open up an entirely new world never before explored by man. So come with us today and join us in exploring this new world, the world of cyber. To help us understand the computer technology that makes cyberspace possible, let's take a quick look at the history of the technology of computer graphics. A man actually talking to a computer in a way far different than it's ever been possible to do before. Surely not with his voice. No, he's going to be talking graphically. He's going to be drawing. And the computer is going to understand his drawings. And the man will be using a language, a graphical language that we call Sketchpad that started with Ivan Sutherland some years ago when he was busy working on his doctoral degree. The MIT graduate student who developed Sketchpad in 1963 had this in mind when he set out to create an alternative to batch input of letters and numbers via punch cards or keyboards using the now familiar light pen and function keys. One of Sutherland's goals was to take better advantage of the natural human talent for eye-hand brain. Three-dimensional interface environments are a much tougher nut to crack. Few current systems go that far beyond the basic vocabulary pioneered by Sutherland. One of the missing ingredients all these years has been a really good three-dimensional interactive device. Some new products, though, appear to overcome previous deficiencies. The Spaceball from Spatial Data Systems is one such product. It is impressively intuitive and simple to use. The user simply grasps the Spaceball in either hand and pushes, pulls, lifts or twists it slightly to control translation or rotation in all directions. The harder you push or twist, the faster the graphics display reacts. The ball is made of firm rubber and doesn't actually move. Inside is an analog sensor that detects the torques and pressures exerted on the ball. This information is sent to the analog digital converter housed in the base of the unit, which then connects to the workstation. In this case, a Sun 3 260 CXP. Another breakthrough device is the data glove from VPL Research, a lightweight glove that senses hand gesture, position, and orientation. Instead of bringing the hand to a heavy control device that typically sits on a table, the data glove puts a lightweight device on the hand and then keeps track of where the hand is using a built-in position sensor. Fiber optic threads sandwiched between the layers of the glove sense bending and extension of the fingers or spreading of the hand. The glove feeds all these sensor parameters to a control unit that can output calibrated records, making it possible to build an individualized gesture library for higher level commands. A team in the Human Factors Research Division at NASA's Ames Research Center has combined the data glove with a speech recognition device and head position sensors. Together, they control a head-mounted display system to create a multi-purpose virtual interface environment. The head-mounted display unit uses two liquid crystal display screens presented to each eye of the user through wide-angle optics. Each eye has a 120-degree field of view, both horizontally and vertically, with a common binocular field of up to 90 degrees that allows natural parallax depth perception using stereoscopic images. The imagery appears to completely surround the user in three space. The operator can explore and interact with the virtual environment just as if they were touching real objects in real time and from multiple viewpoints. Possible applications include long distance control of robots and monitoring or management of large scale integrated information systems such as might be found in future space stations. Virtual interface environments and head-mounted displays have been researched for more than 20 years by a variety of people, ranging from Ivan Sutherland to Nicholas Negroponte. The NASA system is significant because of its skillful use of the latest hardware 
to fit the interactive graphic system onto the human body in an unusually comfortable and unobtrusive manner. The concept of cyberspace, creating realities on the other side of computer screens, opens up a new and very thrilling chapter in uh, the human adventure. For thousands of years, intelligent men and women have known that there lies within, somewhere in our brains, a, a, a universe of, of wonder and of novelty and innovation and creativity. This can be accessed, booted up, turned on, activated by skillful yogis or people lucky enough to be in a place where they know how to do this. But for thousands of years, no one has been able to express or describe these wonders within. Typically, people came back from exploring their brains saying, wow, just the, the expression of wonder and surprise. Occasionally, brilliant artists like Hieronymus Bosch have come back and have put on canvas a little picture or a still frame of uh, this wonderful series of universes within. But now, in the late 20th century, at, uh, here at Autodesk, uh, a band of explorers has assembled and given us the hardware and the software to allow us to go beyond and through the screen and to inhabit, to move around in uh, the cybernetic universe. But the best way to describe this in the most homely terms is it's like an aquarium. When you look at a, a boob tube or put your nose against a computer screen, you're looking at a digital universe there. In the past, all we could do is look at it or perhaps change dials. Now, with the cyberspace techniques, we can go on the other side of the screen and swim around in this aquarium of meeting and meet other people there and, and uh, computer-aided design of reality. Now, there are many words currently used to describe this ability to, to create new universes. We talk about virtual reality or artificial reality. Our prophet William Gibson has described the digital matrix, the consensual hallucination of all human knowledge. Here at this is called cyberspace, and uh, it's a nice place to be. Now, Let's take a look at the development of cyberspace at the Autodesk Research Lab. The Autodesk Cyberspace Research Lab. In a moment, I'd like to take you on a tour of an AutoCAD architectural model, but a tour rather different from any you've probably had before. You see, people are used to dealing with computers, looking at them through screens, where it's impossible to get through the screen into what's on the other side. But using cyberspace techniques and some interface devices that I'll show you in a moment, it's possible to literally immerse yourself inside the virtual world of the computer. Now, to do this, we do need to use some special equipment. And one item of this computerized apparel is what you see on my hand here. This is a data glove with a magnetic Paul sensor on the back that lets the computer track the position and orientation of my hand at all times. And these optical fibers that let the computer sense what gesture my hand is in. You see, in cyberspace, the computer renders a picture of parts of your body as well. So as well as having images of architectural things, you yourself are part of the world. Now, to be inside cyberspace, you need to be able to see what's going on. And for this, you have to wear another piece of computerized clothing, a helmet. Now, this helmet has a magnetic tracker, similar to the one on my hand, that senses the position and orientation of my head, so that at all times the computer can generate an image of what I would be seeing if I were there in such a scene, looking in that direction. The optics here present a stereoscopic view, one image from each of these color LCDs to each eye, and the backlight provides illumination. So let me put on this cyberspace gear and calibrate the system by making a fist gesture with my arm outstretched. There's another piece of apparatus that we have here that I'll use in a moment once the system calibrates. This orb is a six degree of freedom tracker that lets me fly around in any position and orientation in case I want to go to some place in cyberspace which is too far to walk with the limited motion that the wires attached to my head permit. Okay, we have the crosshair up on the screen. If I make the flat palm gesture after my eyes are aligned, we're presented with the virtual scene. Here we have the image of my hand that's being tracked in real time by the machine. I've got fingers. As I wiggle my fingers and clench them, make this gesture, which is recognized by the machine beaming. The image that you see there on the screen, and which I'm looking at in a stereo view in this helmet, moves appropriately. 
So let me grab this orb and move straight back along the z-axis to get a better view of this architectural model. And the model that we're seeing here is the open plan model distributed with AutoCAD, and I'm looking directly at the chair. Now, if I turn my head to the left, I see a different part of this virtual office. If I look up, there's a painting on the wall there. If I look still higher, angling my head up, the computer is tracking me in real time, presenting a view of the light and the rafters and the other side of open plan there. Now, you'll notice that my hand is still with us here, floating in front of me. I can turn it and it's tracked. In cyberspace, the computer senses certain kinds of gestures, which mean things. Part of the point of cyberspace is to make the interface natural. So if I want to manipulate an object, I can pick it up and move it. Or if I want to fly to a different place, I can simply point. So I'll take my hand and point up towards the books on the shelf. And when I make the pointing gesture, the system recognizes that I'm pointing and translates me in that direction. There I am, flying towards the books. If I'd like a bird's eye view of this scene, I can take my hand that's in front of me and point straight up, make a pointing gesture, and fly straight up through the rafters, through the light, up, 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 until I'm high enough and look down, down below me to the periphery of the scene. If I turn around in the other direction and look straight down, the books and the chair are right below me. If I'd like a, a more general perspective, I can take the orb, uh, looking at the scene and fly backwards to look at it in a larger scale. So over to my left now, and there I am looking from the top down into the bottom. You can't really get the full appreciation of this interface unless your head is in the helmet being tracked, but I hope this gives you some idea of the capabilities of cyberspace. This animation sequence may help you visualize what Eric Gullickson saw when he donned the cyberspace helmet. He was literally thrust into the open plan model and could move freely about. What I'd really like to emphasize is the uh, sense of mission and purpose that we have uh, that really is motivating all of us in this project. Uh, as we see it, we're setting out to develop a whole new way of interacting, a new paradigm uh, that will put people into uh, simulated realities. Uh, my particular focus is on the architecture of the overall system, uh, particularly the software. Uh, and I'm especially interested in making the uh, simulated realities uh, seem real, as if one is actually there. When you think about the real world, uh, one primary thing you notice about it uh, that doesn't exist so much in today's uh, systems and certainly not in today's paradigms is that the world is a very dynamic place. When you pick something up and you drop it, it falls to the floor. Uh, forces act on virtually everything that one interacts with in, in daily life. And it's that, <clears throat> that sense of dynamism, of, of interacting with real things, react like the real things that, that we want to provide. What will you see when you look into the mirror in cyberspace? We leave the answer to that question to your imagination. Flip, roll around. What have you done here? I just How the hell did you do that? I just pushed the yoke forward. Pull it. Right hmm. That's pretty bizarre.
Hey, careful, don't, don't fall off. How far can I go, tell me? Oh, I just realized the vehicle's probably still moving. Which means I'd probably drop it farther below the ground. I don't know how that happened. Something changed our elevation. Might have been a Paul Hemus glitch. See, the problem with doing the sensors relative is if you get one bad record, you're fucked. You know it did mean? look like when you were flying that the thing was, was changing altitude, though, too. Yeah, but maybe it wasn't a serious glitch. Well, here, come out of there and we can you start it up again. You mean a glitch in the helmet? A glitch in the Paul Hemus reader. in the helmet, yeah. Well, okay. yeah. best to discover this now. One way to, okay, why don't we, uh, I don't understand why this is relative. Why do you have to have these relative coordinates? Because when the sensor is affecting the way the body is, the sensor's activity is relativized, because I basically have to call a whole jump by that's a relative thing. So why doesn't the head take its position relative to the car? Control here if you're the plane. Because the head is Paul Hemus tracking. Yeah, that's what I wanted to do with the car. I, I want to try commenting out the uh, confined to a single plane stuff and fly a bit. Well, does it? The, yeah. No, the absolute. Oh. You can take the absolute position of the sensor on the head. It's just the way the thing is written now, that's all. It doesn't have to be relative, but this is how it's done now. Is it hard to change? So we don't get error propagation? Or maybe that's not even really hurting us. I guess it's not. Yeah, it shouldn't happen. I mean, it, that's not what the problem was here. I understand that. Yeah. Well, the update's not bad. Look at the light. Anyway, I'm going to light. <laughs> <laughs> Ray, this is wild. This is wild. Look at, look at this. Look at this. I'm like driving and looking around. Yeah. Look at, look at the cloud and the base and the lake. It all works. You turn on the lights. The horizon down there. I'm coming around. Yeah. There we go. I'm coming in. You not only look like a child, you look like an autistic child. <laughs> this is great. Oh, this is wild. Oh, the Hilton's yeah, got an outside wonderful. elevator. Oh, Remember what we said earlier about the success of the steering wheel? <laughs> it really works. It's a simple device. It's seven and a half frames a second or so. Oh, this is so easy. I want to fly with this thing. I mean, enough of this driving around on a plane. I want more degrees of freedom. I want wings. True wings. Give us a smile. Yeah, the lake looks pretty good right there. A lake? lake? Yeah, there's a lake right there. Yeah, it kind of shimmers. Yeah, it does. And, it and the clouds? You didn't plan that then, I think. Yeah, I did. Oh, sure. <laughs> Make it harder if you want, no, Gary. It'd be kind of cool to get on the ground and be on the street. Though. Yeah, we're gonna we're gonna set that up. So, the problem is I'm already like fully maxed out in terms of sensors being able that's to move cool. stuff.
child. <laughs> We're each going to take five minutes and tell you what we think about work, uh, and then uh, some of us will go downstairs and continue demoing. It's real experience uh, that matters. Uh, then. I'm up. Well, okay. Okay. Sorry. Come on, you're up. You're up. Where do I start? Uh, I guess my motivation in doing this is both to move away from the linguistic sort of metaphor interface that's dominating computers today, and to be able to make computers, well, really arbitrarily easy for people to use. Because I somewhat incorrectly in the tape spoke of the interface to cyberspace, but what I really meant was that with the cyberspace system, there's no need for an interface. You could deal with computational objects, be they you know, graphical forms or other more abstract kinds of data, just the way you deal with objects in the real world. We're all born with this ability to live in and navigate around the three-dimensional world. From birth, we move around in 3D, pick up things, and move them around. Well, with today's computational power increasing, as it has increased so far, there's really no longer any need to have one's uh, interaction with the machine or <coughs> interaction with other people as mediated by machines, dominated by words or a paradigm of abstraction. Anyone who's taken AutoCAD and tried to take two arbitrarily oriented position objects and line them up, or, or any of today's other existing computer-aided design systems, realizes that to have to specify things indirectly, to have to specify symbolically through equations or through pulling down and selecting menu items, how things are supposed to be is far less indirect, far less desirable than actually being able to stick your head. It's a very preliminary prototype running on basically a 20 megahertz 386 machine uh, graphics board that enables people to, us and everyone here, to begin to experience and experiment with this new mechanism of directly being in artificial spaces, dealing with design and manipulation of objects. I hope that in the future, this project and the, the cyberspace industry that's developing will go on to make CAD systems more usable for people, make entertainment more fun, make communication uh, between others, between others and their systems more accessible. And uh, I hope we can proceed and make lots of money doing this, and that it's <laughs> enjoyable for everyone. Uh, also, uh, just, just as a, a closing comment, um, I'm more than happy to answer zillions of questions because there's probably lots raised. Um, I hope that everybody here in the near future has an opportunity to actually put their head in the helmet and see what this is like. Seeing the video of, of what's happening behind my shoulder there on that screen really doesn't give you a sense for being there with this shaded color 3D stereo world that surrounds you as you move around. You're, you're literally within that other world. So I hope you'll all have an opportunity. Some of you already have today. Some of you will have an opportunity later today. I hope you all take the chance to come in, put the helmet on, and check out cyberspace for yourself. Thanks, Eric. Oh, <laughs> sure. I should mention that cyberspace and the new interface it, it is <coughs> gendering, or lack of interfaces from gendering, does represent a significant threat to the established way of doing things, both for uh, conventional computer systems and, and large numbers of other systems. If people can construct arbitrarily with arbitrary ease, or, or at least have access to fairly easily alternative realities in which to live, it's a threatening thing for social or all that. Sorry. Yeah. No, that's, that's quite all right. Okay. Uh, are, are, we are we holding questions? questions? I think uh, we're because uh, we, 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 have, we have a deadline uh, uh, at six o'clock. Okay. Um, I prepared a nice collection of slides here. Uh, I was pretty happy with them, but I overlooked one thing. Uh, so you're going to have to look very closely. <laughs> yes, indeed. If we were in cyberspace, we wouldn't have this problem. We have every subject now. If we were only in cyberspace. Well, if we only were. Uh, Eric mentioned that I'm going to talk a little bit about the architecture, and I will touch on briefly how it works. But more than that, I'd like to give you an idea of 
what underlies the architecture, what really is motivating us and what we're driving toward. It is not just the creation of cyberspaces. That's a big part of it. Uh, the first thing to really understand about cyberspace is that it is not a CAD system. It is not an extension of AutoCAD. It is never going to be an extension of AutoCAD. It is fundamentally a medium. It's a whole new medium, a whole new way of, of, of interacting, uh, a new way of communicating knowledge and, and experience, and particularly uh, the kinds of experiences that are not described easily in words. Um, the really exciting aspect of cyberspace and the really important part of it to Autodesk uh, are the applications that are going to arise in it. Autodesk is very well positioned to supply tools to the people who are going to get excited about uh, cyberspace as a medium. One of the nice slides I had for you <laughs> lists uh, a number of application areas, potential application areas, and let me just read, read quickly through the list. Uh, I listed visualization, first of all. That's probably a, a, an obvious application. Uh, there are several telepresence sorts of op applications, that is, uh, ways of projecting one's personality, one's being to another remote place. Uh, that could be used for office visits. Uh, business colleagues could uh, uh, can converse with each other as if they're in the same room, even though they might be uh, many miles apart. Uh, uh, business people could conduct, conduct meetings. Uh, one could hold parties uh, with people from all sorts of remote locations. Games are a very obvious application. Perhaps the uh, uh, games may just be the, the one area that really shows off the uh, potential of, of cyberspace. Uh, other areas uh, include fitness, uh, sports, education, training, uh, tours and explorations, uh, tours of museums, uh, Aquarius cities, uh, real estate developments. Um, participatory theater is another area that, that sh is shaping up as very exciting. Imagine going to a play not just watching it, but being in it, and, and, and determining uh, by your actions how it evolves. Uh, dance, uh, whole body instruments that, uh, uh, that is moving your body to make music. Uh, an application area that just wasn't even feasible, thinkable with today's uh, uh, technology and today's paradigms. Uh, telerobotics, physical therapy, spatial reconstruction, and I mean by that the mapping of space and the, and the, the quick uh, interactive building of models, uh, planning or orchestration of events, advertising and marketing, and, and it just goes on and on. The interesting thing about the list, when you, when you stand back from it and try to get some perspective on it, is that it, it's very different than the kind of list you would see uh, for applications, say, in, in desktop publishing. Uh, all of these things involve whole body movements. They're three-dimensional in nature, fundamentally. Uh, they're the kinds of things that are natural for uh, cyberspace applications. My guess is that when entrepreneurs get a load of this, get a real appreciation for what cyberspace can do, everyone is going to want to create applications in this area. There are fortunes to be made here. It's totally virgin territory. What uh, developers need, however, entrepreneurs need, are tools. Uh, tools and most importantly, a core technology, some bit of technology or code that everyone can rally around uh, and start creating applications for. The problem now is there's no way to get started. What we're working on in the cyberspace project is uh, an architecture that will enable that. Fundamentally, what we have is something like an operating system. We generally call it an operating system or, or the kernel. Uh, it drives cyberspaces. The important thing about it is that there's nothing space-specific in the uh, operating system itself. That is, it can be used to drive any cyberspace. The character of the this, of this space is determined by the developers um, who program the, the dynamic bodies that do whatever they do in the space. And what they do is entirely up to those dynamic bodies. Uh, so there's this core that we supply. Um, the question is how to get that out to people. One way to do it is with the kind of system that we have now and the kind that you see in the library. Uh, that basically is an IBM PC with two matrox boards in it and uh, some other devices, uh, input devices. We call them sensors because from the point of view of 
objects inside the space, uh, an input device is a sensor. Um, the problem with that system uh, is that it's expensive. Um, not everyone can afford to go out and buy that. The important thing to notice, however, is that there are all kinds of, there are gradations from very expensive systems, deluxe systems that have built into them uh, very elaborate sensors, uh, lots of memory, lots of speed, and so on, uh, all the way down to nothing more than an IBM PC and a serial port. What I'm suggesting is that we can do very interesting things. We can get people into the cyberspace game, into the business. We can help provide them with tools uh, by giving them just this core that really is a relatively small C++ program. It's actually a collection of C++ classes. Um, having that, they can begin to uh, develop their own spaces. Uh, they can, in limited ways, enter into spaces uh, with people having more elaborate equipment. Uh, we can do 2D projections onto regular screens. And we can take them far. Uh, so we, that's one way to get it out there. Um, uh, my time is just about up there. A couple other things I'd like to cover very quickly uh, relating to the kinds of things we can do. We can supply the core technology. Uh, the, the next obvious thing to supply are model building tools, uh, connections, direct connections with AutoCAD. We presently use AutoCAD to build the spaces, the models for the spaces. There are better ways of doing that. Uh, right now we're using uh, film roll files and, and it's a two-stage process. We could be a lot more direct about that. We could supply the spaces themselves. We could supply more types of body classes for particular applications. And we could, uh, uh, we could supply space assembly tools. And we could do that rather soon. And that does it. Thank you. <laughs> Everybody, I can deal with that, thanks. Everybody is talking about how uh, this is like really a different space and you can't get it till you've been there. And the reason for that is that it takes this perceptual apparatus and gives it an entirely new frame of reference with an entirely new set of rules. And I'd like to illustrate that just by talking about the different kinds of movement that you can make in cyberspace. Uh, as you saw with the uh, head mount, you can move your head and so you can you can like change your perspective by moving your head. But there's entirely other kinds of movement you could do with your perspective alone. If I suddenly wanted to see the perspective of that lamp, I could check into it. I could look back at my body here, whatever representation of my body was in the cyberspace realm, and suddenly be over there. Or I could jack into another person's perspective. The idea of perceptual movement is completely flexible. You can see everything from anywhere. Uh, physical movement, you saw that you can see your body move, uh, you can see everything move in relationship to your body, and you don't have to worry about gravity, you don't have to worry about any of the normal things like solid, okay, we thought this was going to be great fun, and we went out and got, you know, six degree of freedom, and let's zoom through cyberspace, wow, no gravity, and it's very confusing, because again, it's this perceptual apparatus that's using it. And we're used to hard stuff, and we're used to horizons, and uh, it can be very disorienting. <laughs> For those of you who flew today, <laughs> you know that it's, uh, it can be very confusing. And so now we're to the point where movement is something we have to consider in terms of uh, joining what we know how to perceive with this great freedom of cyberspace. And that means constraining things. We've already taken our sixth degree of freedom joystick, and cut out a few of those degrees of freedom so that we have some control at all. <laughs> uh, the same thing is true with objects. It's kind of interesting to move through a table, but this is not a predictable, real kind of world when you can't do that, or when you can do that. So what we're doing now is taking these marvelous freedoms and learning how to uh, merge those with what we're really physically capable of perceiving without total confusion to our system. Uh, we're working on trying to make smaller movements, more refined things, picking up the book, making sure that uh, our hand-eye coordination works. Uh, and these are the kinds of things that are going to be real necessary in applications for the future that we can see. You need to be able to control uh, yourself in this space, and that's what we're working on next. <laughs>
Okay. Um, I'm going to talk about, sort of pick up where, where Meredith left off, about interface of devices. But before I do that, I'd like to sort of share something about the experience that we've had. Those of you who've had a chance to go in there today, um, it's really interesting. I had the uh, opportunity to actually create the spaces that we're using. And it's interesting to be able to draw something in AutoCAD. First of all, visualize, or visualize what you want to do, draw it, and then actually be in it. And I don't think, this is a whole new thing. Uh, I, <laughs> it's amazing. I mean, we created this world where you could fly around in Cyber City, and Meredith and I worked on the idea of how to design this and what to put in it. And it was sort of a vision in our minds exactly, exactly how it would work. We had to wait about three months before we could actually do it. And within the last week, we actually were able to get in there and fly around like in an airplane or a helicopter or stand there and look around. And it is just absolutely amazing to be able to synthesize something in your mind, construct it with a tool like AutoCAD, and then actually get in there and be in it as if you were standing in this room. And I think that soon other people besides myself will have the opportunity to do that, and they're going to really enjoy it. Uh, it's it's going to be quite amazing. Um, the other thing that I'd like to talk about, there's been mention of, of different input devices, interface uh, techniques that are going to be used uh, the glove, the helmet, of course, is the method of, uh, of actually visualizing this, and the trackball. I've been experimenting, actually I started about three or four months ago, working with voice input. And um, it's interesting because in cyberspace, unlike the way we use computers today by typing or else by direct, direct manipulation of pointing a mouse at a folder or a trash can or something, or even in drawing an AutoCAD in specifying something in a two-dimensional plane, even though you may be drawing in 3D, um, being in cyberspace is totally different. And you may or may not have the luxury of having pull-down menus or things like that. So I've been experimenting with some in the area of voice recognition. And I think that um, what we have is sort of the opportunity to be in an environment and having knowledge of the tools that we want to use, be able to call those by what we associate the tool with. If we want, let's say, something like a magic wand, we can be just like a surgeon. We can be working on a patient. We can say, I want a scalpel, and the assistant puts a scalpel in the surgeon's hand. Okay, so I can say, I want a magic wand, and all of a sudden, the tool is in my hand. It could be a representation of the end of your finger, as with the glove, or even the representation of something like this. Um, this magic glove, I mean, excuse me, wand, could be used to actually point in three-dimensional space, which is something that is quite different uh, than what we're doing now, let's say, in AutoCAD and 2D, because we've got this two-dimensional crosshair. Imagine saying, I want to draw something from that point right there on the wall to that sign to the corner of the TV. And what we can do is, is, I, is locate a point, even snap onto it, draw a vector between one position and another, and actually see the vector being drawn from here to the exit sign, and maybe even having a three-dimensional slider saying, OK, imagine a piece of kite string between here and the exit sign and a little piece of cardboard with a hole on it and say, I want a position that's 35% from that exit sign towards me, and this little thing slides back there. So in essence, what we've got um, is a whole new way of looking and interacting in a three-dimensional space. Um, the desktop metaphor, which is really the current way of using computers, um, is we're going to have to find some new and different ways to interact in a three-dimensional space. And uh, this is a whole new area of research that we're, that we're looking at and uh, starting to explore. So that's it. Well, what you're hearing is people coming uh, into a different world. 
the more real it gets, the more emotional it gets. <laughs> Questions? <laughs> programming methodology to control cyberspace, and it's an issue of control. How do we program cyberspace and cyberspace? And what's the t actual time frame on that? Is it one year, five years? <coughs> Could you work tonight? We do have coming out of the lab visual programming languages that give you the entire semantics of a uh, well-structured functional language by putting blocks together. But it's, I mean, it's going to—it's it's, just—it's going to change the whole programming paradigm. I mean, I guess Eric maybe mentioned that, that this is going to be threatening to some people, but it seems to me it's going to totally open up the whole realm of programming, just to build the traditional programming concepts to control it and to use those to build real cyberspace programming tools. Um, <coughs> yes. Um, it does take a different turn of mind um, when you start thinking about cyberspace. Uh, traditional control constructs, for example, don't ultimately become important in cyberspace. You start to think in terms of things like <clears throat> emergent behavior, simple rules leading to more complex behavior, uh, evolution, <coughs> growth, uh, those sorts of things. Uh, you program individual objects, it's true, but each object has a certain amount of time in the simulated world to, to do its next thing, whatever that might be. And usually it's a very simple move or look around the immediate environment. <clears throat> but there are lots of objects in the world. And uh, as they all do their thing each tick, complex phenomena start to, to manifest themselves. And uh, it's, it's hard sometimes to, to get a handle on uh, exactly what affects your, your moves in programming are going to have. Uh, to me, the important thing is that we have uh, interactive highly interactive programming tools in the future for exploring spaces. There's going to be so much exploring. Compiled languages, I, I don't think in the end are going to cut it. We're using a compiled language now, but uh, we're building a foundation. To add to that, the, the short-term object-oriented techniques serve as well in the sense that not only can these things that are seen as independent bodies in cyberspace, seen not only by the programmers having behavior, but seen in the literal sense graphically, are an object which can be a subclass of another object and pair of behaviors appropriately with all the other inventions of object-oriented language in terms of modular As well, uh, granularity that is appropriate to conceive of parallel rendering and parallel 